Hey everybody, welcome to the tutorial video for Hyperborea. In this video I'm going to show you exactly how to play the game of Hyperborea. If you just want to see a quick overview of how the game plays, bypass this video and check out my introductory video. If you just want to see how the game looks in action, you can check out my gameplay video. And of course, if you're not concerned about any of that, you just want to know what I think about the game, feel free to check out my review. This video is a complete tutorial, so let's take everything down to the table and teach you how to play Hyperborea. Hyperborea is a light civilization game where each player is going to represent a race and they're on this building hextile board. That's going to be randomized every single time you build the game. You have a total of over 30 hextiles to build every hex board. Every player is going to get their own homeland hex tile, which is a three-piece hex tile, but every one of these other hexes is a single. And you can put these all together and build this map based on the various amount of players. The objective of the game of Hyperborea is for each player to try to get the most amount of victory points. Players can get victory points in various different ways. They get victory points just by accumulating regular victory point crystals. And they do that in various different ways, such as visiting locations, cities that are going to have victory points. They can also enter ruins that will give re rewards, such as victory point tokens. It will also give you victory points. Players can also get victory points by using their own personal technologies and also using technologies that they can purchase throughout the game. Players can also get victory points by defeating these guardians of the ruins, removing them from the game. The more of them you defeat, the more victory points you get up to a certain point. Players can also get victory points by defeating your enemies, gaining civilization cubes and adding them to your empire. You can get victory points by being the first to achieve certain achievements. And the game's going to come to an end as soon as a certain amount of these achievements are gained, depending on what you choose before you start playing the game. Players are also going to get victory points just by learning different technologies. Players are going to get victory points by also having dominance across the map. Whoever has the most majority control on each one of these hex tiles is going to get a certain amount of victory points depending on where the hex tiles locate across the map. Players are going to be playing this game, going back and forth, doing their best to mass victory points using the various different ways. Players are going to keep playing until one of the certain amount of victory end game conditions have been met. As soon as that occurs, the players are all going to get one final turn, except for the person who triggered the end game. Players are going to then add up all the victory points. Whoever has the most is going to be the winner. To play the game of Hyperborea, the first thing you need to do is you need to set up the game. So every player needs to get a couple different things. The first thing, every single player is going to need to get the race board. This is three hexagon tiles that are already attached. So it's one single board. And every one of these boards is double-sided. The back side is if you want to play the game with the neutral cities, which none of the players have any special powers. The other side is going to be color-coded for every single player. Your capital city is going to be in the color of your race. So the yellow player is going to get their homeland board with the yellow capital city. The red player is going to get the homeland board, again, that has the red city, the red capital city. And then you're going to attach this to the main game board. That's going to be built up differently every single time you play the game. Now to build up this game board, what you're going to do is you're going to pick a central tile. And there's only six different central tiles in the game. And you can tell the difference between the central tiles and the non-central tiles is because the central tile has the center hexagon and the back pattern on the back. It's going to be outlined in gold while the outer line hexagon tiles don't have that gold outline. So the center tile is always going to be one of the six tiles. Then you have the almost 30 other tiles to choose randomly to pick the outline territories. And then every player is going to attach their homeland board to the main game board based on the amount of players. And there's a map in the game that shows you exactly how to arrange the board every single time you play. But basically players are going to place their homeland board based on however many players are involved in the game. Each player is then going to get a single race board. Every player is going to get 10 miniatures in their color for the race. Every player is going to get one cloth bag. Six development markers coming in the six different colors for the game for all the different kind of developments. And then finally every single player is going to get six different development cubes again in all six colors for the game. Every single player then is going to attach three other units inside their homeland city right outside of their capital city. Now I got to emphasize you're going to place your unit outside of your capital city not inside your capital city at all. They're actually going to be placed outside of your capital city. And every single player is going to start the same by placing three of their units outside of their capital city on their homeland board. It's important to remember at this point, and this rule goes for the rest of the game, one player can never have less than three miniatures on the board at any single time at the start of their turn. So if any player starts their turn at the start of their turn with less than three miniatures on the board for any reason, 
they get to add miniatures back up to the board until they have a total of three. So if a player for some unlucky round happens to have all three of their miniatures knocked out by playing maybe a six player game and they get picked on a little bit, at the start of the turn, they're gonna add three miniatures back onto the board in their homeland capital city tile, but again, not on the capital city. And those miniatures are gonna be added back on the board for free, bringing you back up to three at the start of your turn. Now you'll notice that the center seven hex tiles are gonna be face down, creating a fog of war, so no player knows exactly which hex tiles are gonna be involved in the game. But every player does have their capital city plus two hex tiles they do know about because those are your starting homeland. Remember, your three hex tiles right here form your homeland, yet the one that your capital city in forms your capital city hex tile. It's a slight difference, but some important difference to remember, especially with some of the rules for the game. And once you've set up the entire board, what you need to do is you look for any of the ruins that may be currently present on the board. And you tell the difference between a ruins and a regular city because the ruins is outlined in these dot pattern and it's going to have either a silver circle, a copper circle, or a gold circle. And capital cities themselves have this three quarter circle around them and it looks like it's a built city versus ruins. So you want to look at locate all the ruins that are currently available on the board and they have a silver dot on them. You're going to randomly add two of these silver tokens face down to the board so the players have no idea what random treasures are available in those ruins. If you have any copper ruins, you're going to add two ruined tiles to those copper locations also. Now these central borderland regions right here surrounding the center hex tile, they may possibly also have ruins on them. They will always be silver ruins. There are never any bronze ruins on the borderland tiles. And the final center tile is going to be the gold tile, which is going to have gold reward tiles in the ruins if you possibly have ruins. Now the difference between the homeland tiles, and the borderline tiles, and the central hex tiles any ruins in the central hex tile will get three of these random treasures randomly placed face down in any ruins that may be on that tile. But any borderland tiles are only going to get two reward treasures and any homeland ones are also only going to get two reward treasures. One other important thing to remember is that any ruins that happen to be in homelands will never have a guardian. But any ruins that happen to be in the borderlands or in the central hex tile, anytime you reveal a ruins in any of these locations, they're always going to have one single guardian, some kind of ancient creature protecting those ruins that you will have to defeat before you can move your units into those ruins and explore them to get the treasures. So remember, homelands never have a guardian. Borderlands and any ruins on the central tile will always start the game with a guardian. But once that guardian is defeated, they're not going to come back. I'm going to show you how to play the game with the race powers. Now they usually recommend when you're first learning how to play this game to play without the race powers because they add a little complication to the game. I prefer asymmetrical games so I always suggest putting in the race powers. So at this point every single player needs to pick between their two race powers which are unique to their race. Every single race is going to play ever so slightly differently but it's going to be themed basically based on what your race is best at. For example the red player they're basically a warlike race. So both of the race powers are going to be more on the warlike front, whereas opposed to the yellow player, who is more based on trade, is going to get powers that are more based on trade, such as using crystals or gaining free crystals or using crystals that give you various different things symbolizing trade. So after every single player has picked their one race power that they want to start the game with, the other race powers can be removed from the game. They're not going to have access to it for the rest of the game. So you need to pick and pick wisely because that is your race power for the entire game. Next, every single player needs to take all six of their starting race cubes and they need to stick all six of those cubes inside their bag. And then on top of the six cubes they already have inside their bag, they need to pick one cube of any color they prefer. And this is part of the strategy of the game depending on what kind of tactics and what kind of strategy you want to use to try to win the game. But you need to pick one cube of one single color that you think is going to benefit you the best, looking at the current map layout, looking at your current enemies and figuring your deficiencies. Pick one single cube, Add it into your bag, so now you should have seven cubes total, five that are different color, and two that are the same color. Every single player is going to do the exact same, adding all their cubes to the bag. And now there's only one more decision left for every one of our races to figure out to gain, make them a little bit different from each other. Every single player must start some movement on their dev development track. Every single player is going to have a different progress track, which is going to be used to evolve their empire and give them extra cubes to use to do various different things across the game. You have six different tracks. You have the green track, which is for exploration. You have the red track, which is for warfare. 
you have the purple track, which represents growth of your empire, which is, allows you to add extra units onto the board in various different ways. You have the orange track, which represents progress. You have the yellow track, which represents trade. And finally, you have the blue track, which represents science. At the start of the game, before all players can start the game, they need to move up one of their tracks three spaces along. They need to move one of their tracks two spaces along. And then they need to move one of their tracks one space along. Every single one of these tracks has a total of six spaces. And if you manage to get one of your tracks all the way to the end, you're going to get some extra cubes, two extra cubes. If you only get to this space before you use up your development, you're actually going to get one cube. So this is part of the decisions you want to make right now based on the strategies you want to use versus the opponents you currently have in the game. If you're currently fighting a very warlike race and you don't have a lot of attack powers, you may want to consider learning a little bit of extra war power to help you get those extra combat cubes that maybe protect you later in the game. Or perhaps you decide that you want to have better movement than your opponent, which will allow you to get across the board quicker, possibly getting these extra nice resources. These are all the decisions both of our players need to make depending on what kind of tactics, what kind of strategies, and exactly how they want to play the game. It's now time to reveal the starting techs that are going to be available at the start of the game. Now, don't get confused about these different tech levels. I know you see a Roman numeral 1 through level 4. Don't think of these various techs as levels. They're basically separated just to show you what these tech trees specialize in. For example, the tech tree, the very first tech tree, specializes in green and red. Now, green is for movement. Red is for warfare. So, you know, a lot of these technologies in this deck are going to give you extra powers of movement and also extra powers of warfare. Whereas opposed to level two tech tree is it's gonna give you lots of purple and lots of yellow, which is gonna represent growth and progress. So you can already see that this is a purple, this one's a yellow, this one's red and green, this one's lots of red. So you see the technologies match basically what they are. The fourth level tree is for your orange and for your blue technologies. And then finally, your level four technology is gonna be a lot of your clean up, a lot of your waste kind of technologies. Because the downside that you have to remember about this game is that every time you purchase a technology, it's going to come along with a waste cube. Now, if you ever played games like Dominion or Thunderstone or any kind of game that's a deck builder, you're going to understand the concept of the waste cube. Its sole entire purpose is to clog up your deck, to clog up your civilization, and make things work much slower for you. If you played Dominion, you've seen the curse cards. If you played games such as Thunderstone, you've seen the wound cards. It's the exact same concept. Every time you take one of these technologies and add them to your empire, they're going to come with a little bit of corruption, which is going to come out and possibly slow you down. So every time you get a couple of these technologies, you want to also consider getting the level 4 tech tree technologies, because they can also put to use your gray cubes. Only these technologies can use your gray cubes, so it's a balance of buying all these technologies and occasionally buying these to help take care of all the extra waste you're taking on by evolving with these technologies. Now, every time you play the game, there's always going to be eight revealed technologies at all times. If a player purchases a technology, you're immediately going to replace it. And every time you replace a technology, for example, let's say Red purchases this technology and they're going to get a little bit of corruption, we're simply going to replace it with a new draw, which is also going to come with its own corruption. So every time you reveal a new technology, it's always going to come with this corruption. And every time you buy that technology, you're going to gain on that extra corruption. So again, it's a little bit of a balance. Make sure you're not evolving faster than you can keep up with your own civilization's corruption or you're going to end up with a lot of turns where you can't do anything because you got a full handful of gray cubes. It's now time for every single player to reach inside their bag and randomly pull out three starting cubes to start the game. Every single player is going to start with three cubes. You draw them out of your bag, making sure you're not looking at what three cubes you're getting. Remember, you're going to get one of the seven cubes that you have in your bag and now the setup for the game is complete. You are now ready to play Hyperborea. To play Hyperborea, players are going to alternate taking turns depending on however many players you're playing. You're always pretty much going to go in a clockwise manner. So in a six player game, you're going to go clockwise. In a two player game, you're basically going to be going back and forth. On a player's turn, Players are trying to get victory points, but they're also trying to work towards getting these objective tiles. Because before you started the game, the players agreed to however many objective tiles are going to be the end game condition. There's three different objective tiles in the game. The first objective tile is that as soon as one player owns five technologies, 
doesn't matter what kind of technology it is, as soon as one player has five technologies, they're gonna bring about the end game if this is your end game objective. The next end game objective is if, as soon as one player has managed to get all their units onto the map or in their opponent's graveyard. So if we happen to have two units over in our opponent's graveyard, plus we happen to get all these units onto the map, that's going to trigger this end game condition and the game's going to come to an end. The final end game condition is as soon as one player has managed to accrue 12 crystals on their crystal board or their technology board, that's going to trigger the end game. The only slight difference with this end game condition is in a two player game, this end game condition is actually going to require 15 of these crystals, not 12, and that's only for the two player condition. In three all the way up through six, this is going to represent exactly 12 crystals. Now here's the trick here. Before you start the game, you need a degree if you're going to do a short, medium, or a long game. Now the difference between those is, is in a short game, as soon as one player manages to get any one of these victory conditions, that's going to trigger the end game. And personally, I'm going to tell you right now, and I should mention this in my review, but in case I forget, the short game, the only purpose for the short game is if you're just trying to kill 30 minutes or you just want to teach somebody how to play the game. You're really best off playing the medium game, which is actually referred to as the regular game in the rules or the long game. Now to play the regular game, the game is going to come to an end as soon as two victory conditions have been claimed. Now they don't have to be claimed by the same person, but it has to be two different victory conditions. So for example, this person could claim this one, this person can claim this, claim this one, and as soon as they do, the game's gonna to come to an end. But for example, if this player claimed this, and this player claimed this, the game is not gonna to come to an end. And as a matter of fact, when you start playing the five and six player games, these are not a finite supply. So if you happen to play a five or six player game, one player gets this, and another player gets this, and another player manages to get this victory condition. You need to pull out a piece of scrap paper or something like that to let you know that, that player has also achieved that victory condition. The game is going to continue in the regular game until two of these victory tiles have been gained by some of the players. And then finally, the long game is going to end as soon as three of three of these victory conditions have been claimed. Whether it's all by the same person or it happens to be separated out among the players, once all three victory condition tokens have been claimed, that will start the end game. Now, once a player triggers the end game, they're going to finish out their turn and they're done playing for the rest of the game. So if we are playing a regular game and red claims this tile and then the yellow claims this tile, yellow is going to finish off their turn. They're not going to get any actions anymore. The rest of the remaining players after that end game condition has been triggered are each going to get one turn left over. So in a two player game, once this has been claimed, the only person left to act would be the red player. But if we had a six player game and yellow triggered the end game, we would still get the green, the purple, the blue, the orange, and the red would still get to act, but yellow is not going to get another turn because we've triggered that end game. On a player's turn, the first thing they're going to do, if they happen to have any fortress tiles on any locations on the board, they're going to remove those locations, those fortress tiles from the board. Now, if you happen to have any fortress tiles on any racial powers that require a fortress to activate, like some of the races do, you don't need to pull those off at the start of your turn. You're only going to pull fortress tokens off on any location on the map tile. I'll explain what fortress tiles do in a little bit. Don't want to get ahead of myself, but just know at the start of your turn, any fortress tiles in your color and your color alone, you're going to pull off the board. After you do that, you're going to make sure you have at least three miniatures on the board. If you don't have at least three miniatures and you only have one, for example, out on the board, you're going to add miniatures onto your starting capital city tile until you have at least three miniatures on the board. And that's going to be a free resource for you. You don't have to pay any cubes, any resources, or any actions to do it. You're immediately just going to fill up the three miniatures at the start of your turn. After that, a player is going to see if they have any technologies that trigger at the start of the turn. And you can recognize a technology that triggers at the start of a turn or at the start of your turn because you're going to see a circle on, you're going to see this arrow going around the circle, about 70% of the circle, going in a clockwise pattern. Anytime you see that symbol, that means that effect is going to trigger for you at the start of your turn as long as you've paid for that technology to activate. So for example, if this player had this technology, if the yellow player had this technology in play, and we also happen to have a red cube, we also happen to have an orange cube on top of it, and we also happen to have one of these corruption tokens on it. This technology is now a permanent bonus that we have, and at the start of every one of our turns, 
we're going to get to add two fortresses onto the board just because we own this technology which is called bastions. So we have this technology and as long as the cubes are on it to pay for it, it's going to continuously give us that effect for the rest of the game at the start of every single one of our turns. Now on a player's turn, every single player is going to have some mandatory actions and they're also going to have some optional actions. The very nice thing is you can do them in any order you like. There's no set order you can do them in. The only requirement is that you have to do all your mandatory actions before your turn ends. And then you have to make sure you get any optional actions that you want to do done before your turn ends. Once you end your turn, you can't do your optional actions anymore. But your mandatory actions you have to do. And the only real mandatory action you have in this game is you have to take any cubes that you have in your unused cube location and either place them on one of your technologies or if you don't want to place them on one of your technologies you need to place them on your unused cube space. That's a mandatory action. At the end of your turn you cannot have any cubes left over in your unused space. It doesn't matter what abilities you use to gain a whole bunch of extra cubes. If you don't use all these cubes you lose them so you want to make sure you're not gaining a whole bunch of extra cubes because it's going to be a waste. Your cubes are use them or lose them. You have to use them. It's mandatory. Either you put them on a technology on your tech board, you put them on a technology you manage to purchase, or you put them all over on the, un or on the used action space and your cubes are done with. Now remember every single player's turn is going to start with three cubes in their available cubes location and you're going to get those cubes, you're going to have them at the start of every single one of your turns because at the end of your last turn, you're going to draw back up to three again. So you're always going to have those cubes available to you at the start of your turn. So you have your available cubes. And again, any that you don't place are going to go into your unused cube space. Now, what can you do with these cubes? You can use them to activate various technologies. The various technologies that are available to you is you have the technology of exploration. You have the technology of warfare. You have the technology of growth. You have the technology of progress, you have the technology of trade, and finally you have the technology of science. You're going to place your civilization cubes on your various technologies to get various special rewards from spending your technology or your civilization cubes. And again, of course, you can also spend your civilization cubes on any technologies that you've managed to purchase on any of your prior turns. The technologies available on your race board are called your basic technologies. All these technologies over here are referred to as advanced technologies. Now every single one of your basic technologies has two possible ways to use them. Every single advanced technology can only be used one single way. And the way this is going to work, I'm just going to grab a whole bunch of cubes here so I can explain this to you. Remember we only start our turn with three cubes unless we use special powers. We're not going to have more than three cubes but I just want to explain to you exactly how this is going to work. On a player's turn, they're going to place their cubes on various one of these basic technologies and every single basic technology is going to require a cube of a certain color to be placed on top of it to activate that technology. So for example, if I want to use this exploration technology, I'm either going to use a green cube and use a purple cube or I'm going to use a green cube and a cube of any color. That's what that multicolored symbol means. Now if I use a green cube and a purple cube, I'm going to get these two advances right here. If I use a green cube and any color cube right here, I'm going to get these rewards right here. Now if we would start moving down the track here, we see that if I happen to have a red cube and I happen to have a green cube, I can place them here on this basic technology and get these rewards right here. If I happen to have a red cube and I can use a cube of any single color at that location, I would get these rewards right here and it goes down for every single one of these technologies and every one of the things that they're going to give you. So this technology of exploration, if you put two cubes right here on this location, it's going to give you two points of movement. If I were to place a cube here and then place a purple cube right here, it's going to give me one point of movement plus it's going to allow me to add one army onto the board in any one of my homeland tiles that currently has a city on it. So remember the yellow player has a city here and a city here. This is a ruin so I can add one of my starting units either here or I can add them right here to this location. The next spot on the board is I can put technology tokens here that's going to give me one point of attack or I can choose to take two fortresses. I'll explain fortresses in a little bit. I can place my technology cubes here, put a red and a green to gain one attack and one movement point. I can place technology cubes here to add a unit to the board, again, in any city in one of my homelands. 
or and then I also get one fortification token. I can gain a unit, gain one attack. I can advance my technology exploration levels. I can exp advance my technology levels in a different way. I can gain a victory point. I can gain a victory point and one movement on my technology track. Or I can get one of these advanced technologies. Or finally, I can get an advanced technology and a victory point. The trick here is that, like I said earlier, every single basic technology has two sets of rewards you can get from using that technology. And you have to choose which rewards you're going to go for. And once you made that decision, you're stuck with that decision until you do a reset. So for example, if I were to put a green cube on exploration right here, I can now pretty much, until I do a reset, pretend this part of the technology no longer exists. I can't move this cube over here or do anything along those lines. Once I've started applying cubes door towards one path of each single technology, I'm locked into that until I get the reward from that and until I do a reset. And not only that, on top of that, every time you put a cube down on any one of these technologies, that cube is stuck there until you do a reset. It will never move for any reason unless you have an advanced technology that's going to give you ability, such as smugglers, which allows you to pull your cubes off your board, and there's other things I'll let you do that. But unless you use an advanced technology that gives you that ability, once you place a cube on a location, it is stuck there until you do a complete reset. Not only that, you can only use one of the basic actions for each single technology. So once I've decided to fill up this location to gain one unit on the board and to also gain one attack for whoever I want to do, I can't use this part of the tech tree, period, anymore. Again, I might as well just pretend it doesn't even exist. I can't put cubes there. I can't use it. This part of the tech tree is now gone. Now that's only for that specific tech tree that doesn't lock out my other tech. So I've now used this tech tree. I've used this tech tree. I'm still free to use my warfare tech tree by putting cubes down on that one. But again, that now locks out the second one. Again, pretend it doesn't exist. I can then spend more cubes over here to go ahead and use some of the abilities over here. This would give me two advances on my technology, but again, this part of my tech tree is now wiped out. I can't use it. And I can keep doing that for every single one of my different technologies, picking one of the paths that go on. But again, once I start down that path, I'm locked into that path until I do a reset. Now, the cool thing about every one of these basic technologies and all these advanced technologies is you don't have to fill a, complete a set all in one turn, and you don't have to do them in the order they're available. So for example, if I started my turn and I happen to have a blue and I happen to have a green and I happen to have an orange cube available to start my turn, I could, if I wanted to, I could, let's go ahead and remove some of these really quick so I show you what I'm talking about here. I could, if I wanted to, at the start of my turn, I could simply place an orange cube right here. I could go ahead and place a blue cube right here. And then I could put my green cube right here, again, on the second location. Now I've locked into this set on this technology tree. I've locked into this set on this technology tree. And I've locked into this set on this technology tree, even though I didn't use those techs at all on my turn. So now on the next turn, when I manage to get three brand new cubes on my next turn, if I wanted to, I could finish up those tech trees. And at that point, I'm going to get those rewards. So I start my next turn by putting a red right here. That's going to give me one move and one attack. I can then put this purple cube right over here on this multicolored. Again, still not filling that up. And then I can put this green over here on this multicolor, which is going to give me two technology advances and two different technology trees. Or if I were happen to take the other one, it's going to give me two advances in a single technology tree. But whatever it is, you can fill up your technologies in any order, and you're not going to get the reward until you put, place the final cube on that specific set on that specific technology tree. Now, I know I said a few moments ago that a multicolored space will take a cube of any single color, but there's a limit to that because a gray cube can never be a multicolored cube. A gray cube can only go in a gray cube space, and the only pretty much technologies that will accept a gray cube are the level 4 technologies. Any space that has a multicolor slot cannot take a gray cube. The only place you can ever, ever use a gray cube is in a slot that specifically shows a gray cube. So now I've shown you the only mandatory action in the game that you have to be placing these cubes and you're going to get these rewards. And again, you don't have to use all the rewards you get. So for example, if I took this tech tree and I only was able to move, use the movement because I didn't have anything to attack, 
I can let that attack go to waste. It's not going to carry over from turn to turn. This game has no memory. Whatever you don't use on your turn is pretty much going to be wiped on your turn. So you can't carry over attack. You can't carry over movement or anything. It's use it or lose it just like the cubes themselves. Now the three optional actions you can do on your turn is you can move one of your units into a city and you're going to get a reward based on whatever the city tells you. For example, this city, as soon as I move one of my units into it, I'm going to get one point of movement. I'm also going to get one advancement on one of the technology trees of my choice. If I move a unit into this city, we're going to see it separated by a slash, so I can either take one point of movement or I can take one advancement on one of the technology trees so I can move one of my units into a city. The trick about moving a city, a unit into a city is that once a unit is in a city, they are stuck in that city and they cannot leave that city ever until you perform a reset. Just like the cubes, once one of your units is locked into a location, just like when your cubes are locked into a location, the only thing that's going to pull them out is a reset or death caused by one of your opponents removing them from that location. And of course, that probably means they're going to move in and take advantage of that city. So you have to make sure you're judging this very, very carefully if you want to take the risk of moving one of your units into a city and locking them into a city until you perform a reset. The other action you can do on your turn, and again, this is an optional action, is you can move into any one of the ruins that are currently on one of the hex tiles where you currently have a unit available. Now, if there's a guardian in that ruins, and remember, there can never be a guardian in one of the homelands, just using this as an example. If there happens to be a guardian in that ruins, you have to defeat that guardian by generating at least one point of attack. If you do generate at least one point of attack, he's going to be defeated. He's going to go to your graveyard and be worth victory points at the end of the game. If you happen to be in a hex tile with a ruins, you are free to move one of your units into a ruins. Now, moving into a ruins, just like moving into a city, does not cost you a point of movement at all. All you have to do is just make sure you're inside the hex tile and make the announcement that you're going to take that optional move. If you're moving into a ruins, you're simply going to take the top reward of that ruins, secretly look at what that reward is, and you can decide to either use it right now or save it for later. The only trick is you can only have one of those reward tokens at a single time. So if you were to gain a second one by re-entering that ruins after doing a reset to pull yourself out, and then announcing to do the optional move to move back into the ruins and claim that second tile, you're free to look at that tile, but then you have to pick one of these and burn it and use it for whatever reward it may give you, and then put it in the discard pile, and then whichever one you didn't use, you're free to keep. So the trick here is you can pick up more than one, but you can never keep more than one. So if you already have one, you have to make sure you spend it and use it for whatever action you want to get out of it. The final optional action a player can do, and again, I must emphasize this is optional, so you can actually time when you want to do this. But the final optional action you can do is you can upgrade your civilization. The way your civilization is going to upgrade, you're going to notice that every single one of these tracks has six spaces on it. Once one of your technologies manages to get up to level four on this track, or on any of the tracks, or level six on any one of these tracks, you can, if you want to, you can cash that in for a reward. Now the reward you're going to get is based on how far you made along the track. If you manage to make it to level four and you cash in by returning all the way to zero, you're going to gain one cube of the color that you cashed in. So if I happen to get my blue all the way up to level four and then I cashed in, this is going to return to zero and I'm going to take a blue cube from the supply and I'm going to immediately add it to my bag. Now, if I manage to make it all the way up to the six space, I'm going to get two cubes of the color that I cashed in. So if I were to cash in this exploration technology, or I'm sorry, this exploration research, I would go all the way back down to zero and we're going to see that I'm going to get two green cubes, which I'm going to immediately add to my bag, which means I may draw them on later turns. So just to go over a quick refresher, the only mandatory action you have to do on your turn is any cubes in your available cube space, they have to be spent on either a technology, a basic technology, they have to be spent on an advanced technology, or they have to go to your unused cube space, which was where a lot of your gray cubes will go until you start getting these advanced technologies. The optional actions you can do is you can visit a city, you can visit a ruins, or you can decide to cash in one of your civilization advances to gain extra cubes to add into your bag. Now, one quick point to make about this game, there is a little bit of bookkeeping available in Hyperborea, and it's not too bad, especially once you're used to how the bookkeeping works in the game, but when you activate these technologies to get these rewards, you don't have to spend these rewards immediately. Matter of fact, you can activate multiple technologies and multiple cities at the same time 
to get up a group of rewards and then spend them all at the same time. So for example, some locations such as mountains are very, very hard to move into. To move into a mountain, it takes you extra movement points to move into them. It takes you a total of two movement points. To move into a forest, it's going to take you two movement points. To move out of a swamp is going to take you two movement points. So if I wanted to move this guy into this forest, it's going to take me two movement points. Well, if I were to activate this technology right here, it's only going to give me one movement point and one sword. So I could activate this technology and then move this unit into this city right here, taking this one point of movement and this one point of movement, giving me a total of two points of movement, which would allow me to move into this forest. Now, if you happen to be in a swamp, it also takes you two points of movement to leave a swamp and go to a wasteland type space. So to leave the swamp, I need to manage to find, somehow get two points of movement and then I can leave that space. Now, mountains are a little bit tougher. To enter a mountain space, it takes two points of movement. And to leave a mountain space, it takes two points of movement. Now, there's one trick here with terrain. If you go from one terrain type to a like terrain type, it's not going to cost you any extra amounts of movement. So if I'm currently inside this swamp right here and I want to leave the swamp, it takes me two movement to leave the swamp, plus it takes me extra movement to enter the mountain. So once I manage to get all that movement I need to go from the swamp to this mountain, which is not going to be easy, it's probably going to cost me the ability to use some of these technologies such as this to get two movement, some city use, and possibly other technologies. But once I move into the mountain, it's only going to cost you one movement point to move from this mountain to this mountain and to move back. But if I want to leave this mountain and go back to the swamp for some crazy reason, I'm going to have to spend two movement points to leave this mountain and go back into that swamp. Now remember, like I said, you don't have to use all the bonuses you're going to get from any of your basic technologies or the advanced technologies, but any costs you have to pay are mandatory you have to pay. So for example, if you happen to have a city tile such as this one, that tells you if you want to permanently remove one of these cubes from your civilization and remove it from the game and put it back in the supply, you can spend that to get that reward, but that's the only way you can get that reward. So anytime you have a cost such as that, that cost is mandatory. You have to pay that to get the reward. And there's going to be some technologies that work that way also, along with some tiles that also work that way. And a good example of that would be the diplomacy technology, which if I put, if I happen to have the diplomacy technology, and I put a blue cube on it to activate it. I'm going to draw three cubes on my bag, but all my neighbors are also going to get to draw cubes out. That's a mandatory action that I can't force to not happen. So again, there are some technologies that are going to require you to do some mandatory things, but generally, anytime you activate a technology that gives you a reward, you don't have to spend that reward unless there's some kind of cost involved with it. And again, of course, remember, there is no memory in this game, so any rewards you get from burning these technologies is not going to carry over from round to round. Again, you use it or you lose it. And also remember that you can do things in any order. If I wanted to on my turn, I could simply gain some of this technology right here, move one of my guys into a city to get that reward, move a guy over here, move this guy into the city, get a whole bunch of bonuses, stack them all together, and then use them all at the same time in any order I want. And again, that is definitely part of the strategy for Hyperborea. After a player has done all their mandatory actions and done any optional actions that they wish to do on their turn, they're going to move to the end of turn phase. Now for your end of turn phase, any cubes that you did not use, if you happen to have any cubes left over, they're going to immediately move to your unused cubes location on your city tech board. And if you happen to have any cubes left in your bag, you're required mandatory to draw up to three cubes depending on however many cubes you have left in your bag. So if you only have two cubes left in your bag, you have to draw two. If you happen to have seven cubes left in your bag, it's mandatory that you draw three. You have to draw as many as you can, up to three out of your bag. Even if you only have one cube in your bag, it's mandatory that you need to pull that one cube out of your bag. Now, if you have zero cubes in your bag, then you can't draw it out of your bag. And instead of drawing out of your bag, you get to do a reset phase. It's not optional, it's mandatory. If you have at least one cube left in your bag, you cannot reset, even if you want to. If you have no cubes left in your bag, you have to reset, you have no choice. For a player to do a reset, what they're gonna do is they're gonna pull all of their units out of any cities they're currently occupying. If they happen to be any ruined spaces, they're also gonna move out of any ruined spaces they happen to be currently occupying. If you have any cubes on your board, any cubes on any technologies, and if that technology does not have the infinity symbol on it, now there are some technologies that have the infinity symbol on it, 
any technology that had the infinity symbol, you have the option of leaving the cubes on it, but if that location does not have the infinity symbol, it's mandatory that you need to pull all cubes off of all the technologies that you have, basic technologies and advanced technologies that does not matter, and all those cubes must return to your bag. And that will also mean that if you happen to have any gray cubes in your unused cube section, those gray cubes are also going to go into your bag, clogging up your future progress. Finally, after you moved all of your units off your cities, moved all your units off your ruins, and pulled all your cubes off your technologies and off of all your advanced technologies, you're simply going to reach inside your bag, draw three cubes at random out of your bag, and now you're ready to start your next turn. Now that's how you do a reset. Now if you, again, happen to have at least one cube in your bag at the end of your turn, you have to draw that one cube out of the bag, and you're going to put it on your board, and that's going to be your one single cube to use for your next turn. And then, since your bag will be empty at that point, after the next turn, that's when you're going to get to do your reset. So there's a little mental math you want to be doing to making sure that you're burning these advanced technologies to add cubes into your bag to make sure that you always have a constant supply of at least three cubes in your bag at the every one of, end of every one of your turns so you're not wasting and having inefficient turns where you're only getting maybe one or possibly only two cubes, which is not nearly as efficient as a player who's going to be drawing three cubes every single turn. Players are going to go back and forth, taking turns. Again, every player is going to start with their turn, removing any fortress tokens they may have on the board. They're then they're going to follow that up by making sure they have at least three miniatures on the board. If they do, they're then going to move on to doing their mandatory actions. Any optional actions they want to do, then they're going to do their end of phase. Players are going to keep going back and forth until the predetermined amount of victory condition tiles have been claimed, and that's going to trigger the end game. Once the end game is triggered, players are going to add up all their scores, and a victor is going to be found. And if you forgot from the beginning, every single player is going to get one victory point for every single victory point gem they happen to have. Players are also going to get victory points based on however many ghosts they have in their graveyard. If they have one ghost in their graveyard, it's going to be worth one victory point. If they have two ghosts in their graveyard, it's going to be worth three victory points. If they have three ghosts in their, victory, or their graveyard, it's going to be worth six victory points. And each additional ghost beyond that is also going to be worth one victory point. Players are also going to get one victory point for every enemy they have in their graveyard to a certain point, and I'm going to explain that in just a second. There's a little bit way of doing this combat of getting your victory points with your units. I'm going to skip that for a second. We're going to come right back to that in just a second. But do know that you're going to get a victory point for every single enemy that you do have in your graveyard. Players are also going to get one victory point for every single colored cube they have in their civilization, whether they have to be on their tech board or whether they have to be in their bag at the end of the game. The only cubes that don't give you victory points are the waste cubes, but every single other cube that you have in your empire is going to give you one single victory point at the end of the game. Players are also going to get two victory points for every single one of these end game victory tiles they happen to claim. They're all worth two. Players are also going to get a victory point based on the reward for each single technology. Some technologies will give you zero victory points. Some technologies are going to give you one victory point, and some technologies are going to give you two victory points along with their ability to also generate victory points during the game. And finally, players are going to get victory points for controlling certain sections of the board. They're going to get one victory point for every single one of their homeland tiles they happen to control. They're going to get two victory points for every single borderlines location they happen to control. And they're going to get four victory points if they happen to control the center tile. Now the way to figure out if you control a tile is you just need to have more units than anybody else in that current location. So if you tie with another player, nobody has dominance in that tile, and nobody's going to get that victory point. Now, if there happens to be a ghost in that location, they do count towards somebody that you have to have more than to earn the victory points for that location. So in this circumstance, nobody's going to get victory points at all. In this situation, the yellow player is going to get four victory points for controlling that tile. And that goes for the borderland tiles and also goes for the homeland tiles. Center's worth four. Borderlands are worth two. Homelands are each worth one. And if after all that you happen to have a tie for whoever has the most victory points, the tiebreakers are going to be whoever has the most controlled hexagons. If that's a tiebreaker, the next thing in line is going to be whoever has the most cubes, not including the gray cubes, because remember they're waste. They're not worth anything at all. And then finally, the person who played last in turn order is going to be the final tiebreaker. Now, I know that's a lot to absorb to figure out how to play Hyperborea, and it can be when you're having somebody present it to you like this, but once you play Hyperborea a couple of times, the game really starts to click. 
Now, having said that, though, there's just a couple more points I need to cover very, very quickly. Now, you notice at the start of the game, there was a fog of war, which means that all the center tiles happen to be upside down. All center tiles are going to remain upside down until a player manages to get one of their units next to one of these upside down tiles. As soon as you move next to an upside down tile, now not on it, as soon as you move next to an upside down tile, you're going to reveal all tiles that you happen to be next to. And again, it's as soon as you move next to it, you're going to go ahead and reveal all those tiles. So if you move here, you're going to reveal the center tile and it's going to be revealed for all the other players to see. And at this point, if you happen to have any movement points, you can definitely use them to move into that location if you like. And of course, you also have to respect the movement restrictions for some of the various terrain locations. Most of the terrain locations you're going to see are going to be these wasteland spaces, which look like a blasted desert. And it makes sense if you understand the theme for the game. This is a futuristic world that suffered a major holocaust. And all six of these factions are basically crawling back from the ruins of chaos, trying to become the new dominant faction in this new world order. So all these brownish looking tiles are going to be wasteland tiles. The green tiles are going to be forest tiles. Remember, they cost one extra movement point to enter, but you can leave them okay with no problems. Swamps cost one extra victory point or one extra movement point to leave, but you can enter them with no problems. And mountains cost one extra victory or movement point to enter, and they cost one extra movement point to leave. And again, if you move from a like terrain to another like terrain, it's not going to cost you any extra movement points at all. Now, the one small caveat to that, just have to throw another monkey wrench into things, but I'm going to throw it out there just so you know it does exist. One of the races, the Emerald Kingdom player, does have one racial power, which allows them to ignore any extra movement point restrictions for any terrain. So if you happen to be the green player and you happen to pick that racial power, you can enter and leave any one of these special trains without having to spend any extra movement points at all because that just happens to be what you're very, very good at. One more final point to make about movement, and it is an important one, and you can use this for very various different tactical purposes if you like. If you happen to move one of your units into a location with an enemy unit, you have to stop moving for the rest of the turn with that unit, even if you have movement points left over. And that's going to interrupt your movement unless you can somehow defeat that unit. And then if you defeat them and you still have leftover movement points, then you can use them to move into that next location. So anytime you enter a hex that has an enemy unit, no matter how many movement points you have left over, you can't move that unit anymore until you defeat that unit or until the next turn comes around. And again, once the next turn comes around, you're free to leave that square with no penalties at all. The next thing we have is combat. Now, combat is done by trying to gain the sword technology or the sword symbol. That's going to give you one point of attack. Every single unit in the game, whether it's one of the player's armies or whether it's the ghost, has basically one hit point. It takes one sword to defeat an opponent's unit. So if we happen to be in this location and the red player also happens to be in this location, as soon as I can produce at least one sword on my turn, I'm going to defeat that red unit and they're going to go to my graveyard. Now the only thing that stops that are these fortress tiles. Every single fortress tile is going to stop one point of damage. So if I happen to have a red unit here and the yellow player is here and the red player has managed to put two fortress tiles in this location, the yellow player is going to be required to create three swords worth of damage to take this guy out. Now I could do one point of damage and remove one fortress tile from the board and possibly even do a second point of damage, but I cannot take him out until I destroy all the fortresses of that player's color, and that's very important in a multiplayer game where you can have different colored fortresses of different units. If I had a three-player game and the purple player was here with one of the purple fortresses, that purple fortress is not going to protect that red player. The only thing that's going to protect this red player are fortresses in their own color. And as another further example, if we were playing a three-player game and the purple player just happened to be in this location, the yellow player was playing very stupidly and attacked the red player with only one sword, and that would get rid of this single fortress, and then the yellow player could not get any more sword power this turn. If the purple player happened to be next in line, they can go ahead and generate a sword, kill this red player, which is going to give them a victory point at the end of the game. So you have to be careful about that, be very smart about that, and watch how much swords you can generate because one sword will take out one unit or one fortress token in that player's color. Now remember a few minutes ago when I explained to you there's a little trick to gaining victory points for defeating your enemies. Well here's the trick to getting victory points for defeating your enemies. 
This game has a built-in mechanism which is going to stop you from preying on your opponents and picking on a weak player. The first time you kill one of your opponent's units, that unit is going to go directly to your graveyard and it's going to be worth victory points at the end of the game. The second time you kill that an opponent of that color, you're not going to get any benefit beyond defeating that opponent unless you've met one condition. And that one condition is you manage to kill one single unit for every single other player currently in the game. So how this is going to work exactly is let's say I happen to be the yellow player. On my turn, I'm going to kill the red player, and that red player is going to go to my graveyard and be worth one victory point at the end of the game. On a later turn, I move to this location and kill this red player. Since I only have one red player and I don't have any purple players in my graveyard yet, when I kill him, he's not going to my graveyard. He's actually going back to my opponent who can pay to bring him back on the board on a later turn. If I kill another red guy, the same thing is going to happen, and that's going to keep on happening until I manage to kill at least one purple guy, adding the purple guy to my graveyard. Now that I have one player in, or one unit in my graveyard for every single other opponent in the game, and that does mean in a six-player game I need to accrue five different colored units in my graveyard, once I've managed to do that, any additional units I happen to kill, instead of going to my graveyard, I'm going to get a single victory point crystal for, and then I'm going to return that unit back to that player. But again, I need to have a complete set of one unit for every single one of my additional enemies that happen to be in the game, and then I can start slaughtering them, and instead of getting a second one in my graveyard, it's going to be returned back to my enemy, and then I'm going to get a victory point in place of it, and that's going to prevent you from basically slaughtering all of your opponents, putting them all in your graveyard, causing a big hindrance to your opponent. So that's why you can only have one unit per enemy of a certain color in your graveyard the entire game. So the basic moral of the story here is kill equally, and once you've killed equally, kill with unwanted abandoning, because after that they're all going to be worth victory points. The next reward you can get from your technology is the fortress symbol. Now I've already explained fortress to you earlier. What they're going to do is they're going to prevent you from taking points of damage from your enemies. For every single fortress you have in play, that's one extra point of damage your opponent needs to do to defeat one of your units. The only trick with the fortresses though is you can only build a fortress in a location where you currently have a unit. So if I was not playing smart at all and I happen to put some points on some technologies, that's going to allow me to gain a unit and also allow me to gain a fortress. For example, if I put a purple out and I put out in any color, that's going to allow me to add one unit onto the board and it's also going to allow me to gain a fortress. I can't put the fortress over here in anticipation of moving to that space later on in the turn. What I would have to do is I would have to get this unit over here and then once they're there, I can build the fortress. But it's not that big a deal because remember, you can get a whole bunch of rewards from spending your technologies and then spend them in any order you want on your turn. So I could technically manage to possibly do something like put a green and in any color here, which is going to give me two points of movement, allow me to add a unit and allow me to add a fortress, possibly move twice and add that fortress or something along those lines. There's only a couple more quick symbols I need to explain to you and then everything else is going to make sense and you should be able to play Hyperborea pretty easily. The next symbol is this little symbol that looks like a strange little looking man that's made a head of a upside down triangle in this little strange shape. Anytime you use a technology that has that symbol on it, it's going to allow you to add one unit onto the board in any one of your homeland hexes that currently has a city on it. Now I keep emphasizing that because some of these races actually have a city in all three of their homeland hexes, but most of them, such as the yellow and the red, actually only have two cities. One here and one here, and the last one's usually a ruin for most of our different races. But again, there is one of them that has a city in all three of them, and that race can build in any one of the three homeland hexes. And not only that, the purple player actually has an ability that's even more powerful than that. They can actually build even further out. The purple player has a racial power, and again, you do have to select this racial power. If you don't select that racial power, you don't get to use it. But anytime they kill a ghost, it doesn't matter where that ghost happens to be on the board, however further deep into the world they happen to be, but anytime they kill a ghost, they're going to remove it from the board, and instead of putting it in the graveyard for victory points, they're simply going to replace it with one of their units adding it to the board. And that does allow you to break the rules about only being able to add units to your own current homeland hex tiles, so you got to watch out for the purple player and their ability to spread across the board very, very quickly. There's also a purple technology here in the technology stack, the level 2 technology stack that allows you to actually clone your units. And when you use that technology, that allows you anytime you have a unit in any location 
doesn't matter which hex tile they're in, if you use that technology and manage to use the technology to gain a unit, you can actually spawn that unit in any current location where you currently have a unit. And again, that's another way to violate the rule about only adding more units to your homeland tile for the basic rules. There's only one minor thing left to explain to you, and that's that anytime you claim a technology and add that technology to your empire, that technology is available for you to use immediately as soon as you gain it, so you don't have to wait around, so you can actually plan very, very well. If you happen to have enough cubes, for example, if I happen to have four cubes by using different things or different abilities, and I manage to get this, use this ability that allows me to purchase a technology, I could add that technology to my empire and then immediately use that technology to get whatever reward that technology grants me. So that's another strategy that you can do. And not only that, anytime you purchase a technology, if you don't like the technologies that are currently available, you can pick any one of the four technology trees and decide to cycle that technology tree before you make any of your choices. So I could, if I wanted to, I could cycle this technology tree. All these two are going to be discarded, removed, and then we're simply going to replace with two new technologies. And then the nice thing is, I don't even have to pick those two technologies if the new technologies are ones I don't like. I'm still free to pick any one of the eight technologies available in the game. You can only cycle once per technology purchase, but you can do it to any technology tree, and you don't even have to pick from that technology tree after you do the cycling. It's so again a little tactical thing you can do, especially if you feel like gambling or you think that there's a couple different decisions you want to do, but you just want to gamble a little bit and see if that next technology is the one you're really going to need. The final symbol that I already went over, but I'm just going to refresh you really, really quick in case you forget. Anytime you see this symbol, that's a circle, a multicolored symbol with some parentheses next to it. Anytime you use that technology, you can advance one of your technology trees that many spaces as there are parentheses. So for example, this one right here, you see it's a circle with three parentheses symbols. That means you can pick any one of your technologies and advance it three spaces. Now, if you happen to be close to the end and you advance it extra, any carryover is going to be basically lost. So you want to make sure you pick a technology that you can actually get all three movements out of because there's no carryover there. But anytime you use one of these locations, such as this city right here, if I were to move a unit into this city right here, I'm going to get four tech advances on any technology of my choice, but all has to be the same tech unless it shows a multiplier or in case you get this ability right here, which allows you to increase two different technologies, each one space apiece, much like this technology right here is just like that basic technology. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial video for Hyperborea. I know this was kind of long and it seems really, really complex, but believe me when I say Hyperborea, when you know how to play the game, the play, game plates, game play, sorry, makes a lot of sense. This game makes a lot of sense how to play it, how to do your actions, and everything flows very, very well. Matter of fact, there's some very, very minute case issues that you may make mistakes of the first time you play the game. I know that occasionally people forget that you always have to have at least three miniatures on the board at the start of your turn. Otherwise, you get some free draws. I know that's one common rule that people sometimes forget when they're learning how to play the game. And there's some other minor details, such about the movement across the terrain, that if you move from a light train to another light train, it doesn't cost you the extra movement. But those are very, very minor details. The rest of the game flows extremely well with the technologies, with the rewards and the symbols. Now, some of the symbols may be a little bit odd to get used to, but there is a full FAQ for the game. And there's also a section on the back of the rulebook which explains what all these symbols do. So hopefully, between my tutorial video and my gameplay video, which is going to make all this make a heck of a lot more sense, you can figure out how to play Hyperborea. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoy this entire video series. And as always, if you have any comments or questions, leave them in the YouTube comments below. Feel free to email me at off the shelf board game reviews at otsbgr at gmail.com. If you enjoy this video series and you want more, please subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.